Okay, at this point, you're probably noticing this engine is partially assembled already. Well, I spent three hours on the raw footage installing the crankshaft and setting the bearing clearance and installing the camshaft and cam bearings and all of that. And I had a SD card failure. So I had this cheap SD card, unfortunately, and it did not survive. Halfway through filming another video, it shut down and the camera quit recognizing the SD card. I found some recovery software online and was able to get back a little bit of it. So what I did get back is installing the camshaft, the timing gears, and timing cover. What I lost is the first walk around of the engine block, installing the crankshaft, and setting the bearing clearance for the three main bearings. Then I will add the video I was able to recover with the camshaft and timing cover, and then we'll go on from there. But first, let's do a quick walk around of what I have so far. So the block's painted up at this point. The only thing I did not remove, it's hard to see here because of the light, but I did not remove the bushing for the governor drive gear. When I had the gear installed, there was actually very little play for that. It sits in good shape, so it's not a big deal there. One thing I didn't notice until I cleaned it up very well, and I mentioned on the teardown video how I did not see any cracks in this block. Between cylinders one and two, once I cleaned it up real good, there is a small crack. It does go all the way through that web. There you go, you can see it. But there's no gap there. Um, my other block actually had a pretty good size gap in all of them. But that's not really a sealing surface at all. The head gasket seals against the cylinder sleeves on the compression side anyway, so we're good there. Did also already install the water jacket train. After painting, I chased all the threads on every threaded hole here to make sure they're cleaned out. And we're pretty good on the deck besides some corrosion around the water jacket holes. One more thing I want to mention here before I move on to the next section. Um, something that really come in handy cleaning out this block. Like if you look down here, these surfaces where the cylinder sleeves seal. So there's a couple O-rings here that seal the water jacket. Those surfaces especially are really hard to get to, but we've got a flapper wheel, sanding disc, and an extension to put on my drill. I was able to really clean those up nice. And all inside this water jacket and stuff that come in handy, I did the same extension, but had a wire wheel on here. So while I was cleaning all that up, I was able to get in everything with it for the most part, that and a couple different wire wheels okay next up we're going to install the tappets so I'll get a little bit of grease in the bore of the tappet I'm going to grease the tappets too but that's just some assembly lube here I'll move the camera in just a minute so we can get a better view of this stuff. Okay. Something to note here. It is very important that the tappets get installed in the same orientation they were removed. The cam lobes are worn into these tappets, and if you switch them around, you're going to wear, off your, wear out your lobes. But this is the front of the engine, so I just punched holes in the foam when I took them out. I've since cleaned them up. Give you an idea what they look like. It's where the push rod sits. 
This part sits in the bore. That's where your cam rides. You're not going to be able to see all of these installed. It's just hard to get the camera down there and me work down there at the same time. But just to give you an idea, these two. And I'll show you a quick vid on how they're laid out afterwards. Take it. Put plenty of lube on there. It should just slide in really easy. That's kind of it. I will end up putting some lube on the flat tappet surface before I put the camshaft in. Okay. I'll put a little bit of assembly lube on the cam bearings. But on top of each tap it. Okay, this is how the tappets are sitting down in there. They just slid all the way down into their bores. As long as the engine is upside down like this, they will stay there and stay out of the way when you slide the camshaft in. Everything else clean and wrapped ahead of time. Okay, this is our camshaft off the parts tractor. Those tappets are also off the parts tractor, so I'm going to get assembly lube on this thing and put it together. Okay, you just got to go real easy with it so you don't tear up the bearings because the journals can't catch on the bearing, or the load, cam lobes can't catch on the bearings. I guess the journals can too. All right, so there's one thing I want to do real quick. Installing those first two wiped all the assembly lube off. Well, a lot of it anyway, so I want to add some to those two journals again. Now I know this has to be timed. We'll talk about timing in just a minute. I want to make sure it fits all the bearings and actually goes in before I deal with that. Yes. Good deal. This thing is starting to look like an engine again. As far as cam timing on here, it's out right now because I just popped it in place. But looking at the manual for this particular engine, it's telling us there is a straight line and an O. On the straight line, they say match the straight line with the matching straight line on the crankshaft. And the O on the opposite end matches the O on the governor gear. So we have a straight line here. And a straight line over here. This one's hard to see. So we're going to pull this out. Rotate it until they line up. So this gear is now in time. The governor gear will actually line up with this O. Oh. Another part that we need to install. We have a spring and this brass piece. And where this goes into the end of the camshaft. This is spring loaded. 
And this piece of brass actually presses against the timing cover and the spring keeps the camshaft pushed back so there's no end play on the camshaft. Something I am going to do a little different than most here. I'm not going to use a paper gasket for this. I'm going to use Permatex Ultra Gray. Ultra Gray is pretty good stuff. I've had a lot better luck with it. Got a very thin amount around there. It squishes out pretty good. I don't want it to be a mess. Get it on this crankshaft seal. These screws I'm actually going to paint and touch up separately. Except I'm missing one. Okay, now here on the bottom, normally there's a plate that bolts against it and covers most of this. I don't want the RTV to actually dry like that. So I'm going to use some spacers, a couple shorter ones. If I damage the paint underneath here, it's not a big deal because it's covered with a plate anyway. All right, cams in, timing covers in place. So in this step, we're going to install our pistons and wrist pins onto the connecting rods. Right. So I have all, of my, all four of my connecting rods, and they're already cleaned up. These are the ones out of my original tractor. The ones out of the parts tractor were in pretty bad shape, and the pistons were seized into a couple of the cylinders, so I didn't even mess with those. But they're all cleaned up, should be good to go. There's a couple of things we need to pay attention to orientation of the connecting rod. If you notice, this is offset, the I beam's offset from the big end. And they're all four the same. These are actually marked as the cylinder three, cylinder four, and so on. But when you install these in the tractor, two of them are going to be oriented where the offset longer portion of the big end is facing the front of the engine. Two of them will be the facing the back of the engine. But we'll worry about that later. Let's see what we got here for parts. So this is out of my engine kit from yesterday's tractor. Non-returnable if seal is broken. Bet it's too late to return it now anyway. All right, right off the bat, we have some instructions. Probably generic instructions. Yeah, pretty much. Um, basically, clean everything, put it together right, and make sure you break it in correctly. And this break-in period is probably for the rings themselves. <clears throat> we have two O rings for the bottom of the leap. I guess that sits in there to keep it from bouncing around. We also have one in the bottom of the box. Okay. It's packaged pretty good. Nice and oily. Okay, here. 
So we got our piston already installed in the cylinder. Too bad it doesn't work that way. I fit. All right. Start with checking out the sleeve here. Too early to see anything. See if that shows up in your in the camera there. You can see the cross hatch pattern real nice. Red light on the right end, you'd see in there great. Looks decent. These are your two grooves for your O-rings. Piston pin. Rings are already installed on the pistons. I'll clean after I assemble the rods on these, you know, right before assembly, I'll clean them off really good and dip the whole thing in oil, get it soaked into the rings. But um looks like good quality stuff. This cloth I'm using apparently is leaving a lot of lint on it, so definitely need to clean all that out. These pistons do not seem to have an orientation. The instruction sheet says nothing about orientation either. It's very generic instructions. Some pistons will have a mark designating front of the engine. There's a painted, uh, well, that's not even paint. I think that was just something off the packaging. Uh, it says AC125, so I guess that's Alice Chandler's 125 cubic inch. But there is no front. So, it, in this case, it should not matter which way we orient the rods. Although, since I have a stamping there, I'll make sure they're at least all the same once they're installed. Doesn't really matter. Um, the pistons I removed, I don't want to get this board too dirty because I want it to stay clean. So, let me move this. Got two different ones here. This one is off of my part or my tractor, and this is off the parts tractor. This particular one is a factory piston. Um, you even have your your cast iron oil ring. Um, but there is no designation on these for front either. This one is the aftermarket. And there's nothing designating front on this one. Also, and these are pretty dirty, but I have some others. I've, I don't have them with me now, but I cleaned them up really good and just kind of as paperweights. But didn't see anything. A ten four B. Not sure what that means. These look very similar to the ones I'm installing now. All right. So, essentially what we do, push this pin through the piston and the rod, tighten down a pinch bolt. I can't find the torque spec for this. I assumed it was in the manual. I have two different manuals, and it is in neither one. They talk about the rod bearing cap bolts or nuts but nothing about the pinch bolt as far as torque it just says it's there um so i'm going to put them tight by hand probably 20 ish for now and then do a little bit of research and go from there before i install them so in this case the bearing surface that these ride on is the piston and I'm not going to bother putting grease or oil in there now. It's oily from the lube that was on it. But once this is all together, I am going to 
clean this right before assembly, sink it in oil, move it around, and oil will get in these holes and lube everything up and get behind the ring, so we'll be good there. Now, what you need to do, make sure the pin is centered. And the pin needs to be the same spacing on each side. And the rod needs to be centered. Now this isn't, we don't need to put feeler gauges in between it and make sure it's 100% perfect. But it needs to be 100% visually perfect anyway. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm just feeling on both sides how far the pin is, and the pin goes is just inside the piston a little bit, so it's easy to squeeze it and make sure it's centered. And then at the same time, when I'm feeling the pin and I know it's centered, I'll make sure the connecting rod's centered. And we're good there. Like I said, I will make sure these are torqued properly before I install it. I just need to do a little research and see what I got. All right, one down. There we go. All fours ready for install once I torque that pinch bolt correctly. Looking at this here, you can see the offset of the big end. One and two are facing each other, and three and four are facing each other. All set to move on to the next step. Okay, next we're going to install the sleeves. And to start off with, I'm going to dry fit one just to make sure we are all good there. I won't start at the front. I'll do number two. It's easier to see everything with the camera. Actually snapped into place pretty good. Feels just a slight amount higher than the deck. The book tells us that this liner should stand up above the deck two to five thousandths. So just to check that out, put a straight edge across it. Find the right feeler gauge here. To measure this, I'm starting off with the five thousandths blade, and if it does not fit or fits snugly, we're good to go. In this case, it's it is not sliding under. If it does, it sticks, and it's because this is leaning. Let's go down to the four. All right, it was just here. There we go. Four thousandths. Yeah, we flatten it out. It's just there. That one's a little out oh, there. Yeah. It's about four thousandths of an inch. And honestly, if it was a tad taller than this, it should not be an issue. I'll check them all once they're in.
All right, so I forgot to hit record. Awesome. Before inserting the sleeve, we need to install these two O rings in your grooves here. I'm going to use silicone grease. Get a good coating all the way around the O-ring. And I've already cleaned these sleeves. And then I will put good coating over here. And I put a coat on the surface and the block where the rings actually seal against the base of the water jacket there. Bit of pressure yeah. slides into place. Okay, ready to install our piston. First off, I've had it soaking in oil just to get oil built up behind the rings and all around the wrist pin. And I'll do this off camera here, but I wanted to show you that. All right, just something to catch the drips. And install our bearing here. Rotate it a little bit. There we go. All right, bear. And on the manual, we had a little bit of an offset. Notice how this end, so this end of the big, this side of the big end. Sticks out further this way on the I-beam. Well, that faces away from the nearest main bearing. In this case, we're doing cylinder number two. The nearest bearing is in the center, so it's going to face the front of the engine. Next thing we're going to do is clock our rings. The three compression rings need to be offset from each other. And the oil control ring, it's got three parts here. <clears throat> the upper and the lower need to be offset from each other. Okay. Yeah, the book does not give us a spec on where to orient the gaps. In reality, unless you had pinned rings, it doesn't matter because they rotate as the engine's running anyway. Okay. Now you had to compress the piston ring. Slide the piston up just a tad so I make sure I'm 
all the way down below that oil ring. All right. So I want to make sure we tap this ring compressor so it's down square against the top of the cylinder. And if we did this correctly, this should work. All right. We're in. Okay, we were going straight down and I can look through this other cylinder and saw the big end lining up with the crank journal. So I just went with it. All right, let's spin this over and see if it's possible to shim these bearings. So originally I did not plan on filming this part necessarily, at least not in detail, because while installing the crankshaft in my lost video, I did all this. But we'll we use plastic gauge to measure our bearing clearance to get it shimmed up. I don't know yet if I'll have to make any shims. Here's what I got to work with. There's a few here. Not too many. Um, I did end up making a few shims for the crankshaft. I had some thin stainless steel stock. I laid one of these over it, traced it out with a Sharpie, and then cut it out with scissors. These are what your rod bearing shims look like. So I'll just put two of these in, start with that, and go from there. There's a couple of them that are thin, but most of them seem to be the same thickness. I'm not worrying about what the thickness is at the moment. We'll put it together, measure it up, and then if we need to adjust and change it, we'll worry about it. So the way these sit on here, basically they'll be sitting right there like that. Now we need a piece of plastic gauge here. Our range is going to be the green plastic gauge. I'll cut a piece off here. Inside of this, there's a little plastic string. You lay the plastic string across the bearing journal. It stops sticking to your fingers. Install the cap. There's some grease on these threads just because a couple of them got tore up coming off. But luckily I had a parts engine to pull some off of. After install and remove them multiple times while doing this clearance measurement, I don't want to tear them up too bad. Yeah, this one might be boogered up. I'm just getting it close with this, by the way. I don't plan on torquing it with this. Still loose. 
Yeah, still lose on both of them. Spec for this, 35 pounds. So I go evenly. And I'll do about 15 and 15 and go up to the 35. Maybe even stop at 25. Okay. All right. So both the 25. This will be the last one. All right, now you don't rotate the engine while that's on there at all. Oh, that one fell all the way through. Okay, you can see here where it's spread out, right? That string got mushed. You can see it on there too. The way we tell what size we have, try to get this in camera here. One side's metric, one side's inches. We're going to see which one matches our width. So that green one right there is about the same. That white one's too large and that one's too small. So we're at point zero zero two. That's our clearance. I did not look up specs yet, so let's check out spec. <clears throat> so it tells us here bearing the shims are two thousandths each, and the bearing must be adjusted to two thousandths. 0 0.002 inches. So we're right on the money for this one. Right on the money first shot with just those two shims. So we're going to go with that on this one. And I'll clean all this plastic off of here. You don't want to leave any of it. And I'll lubricate it and make sure it still spins and everything rotates because of obviously there could be an issue there. Plenty of assembly lube. Make sure our shims are lined up. You want to make sure the shim, let me show you on this one. You want to make sure the shim is even. It can't stick in between the bearing halves. It's got to be like this. Now, once they're in place, these tabs actually stick. These tabs actually stick out, and that makes it easy to see. But got to make sure they don't overhang into the bearing surface. Or the edge of the bearing, actually. Once again, I'm not tightening it with this. I'm just saving some time. A few steps to 35. Ooh, one of my shims moved, and I didn't tighten it in steps like I wanted to. Okay, so we'll even those shims up. Start with this one. Okay, so we'll do 20. 20. 
30. We'll go to 35. All right, do the rotate. I also have to be careful I don't push my... Oh, yeah, it rotates fine. Got to make sure I don't push my sleeve out the bottom. All right, one down, three more to go. All right, sleeves, pistons, and rods are in. I really wish I would not have lost the footage of installing the crankshaft. It was a little bit more interesting because when I was adjusting the bearing clearance for the crankshaft, it took several attempts and shim adjustments and measurements to get it right. But um, the rod bearings... We're right on with two shims on cylinders one through three and on cylinder four I actually run out of shims so I had to make shims for one side and put it together once and it was right on the money at 2007 inch something to note about the plastic gauge we're using to measure there's tons of YouTube videos on using this so you can dig into that but three different sizes let me try to get the light right. There we go. So depending on your clearance you're looking for, since we were going for two thousandths and it was about the same on the main bearings, 0 0.001 to 0 0.003, so we use the green. If you're going four thousandths to nine thousandths, you use the blue. If you're looking for the range of two thousandths to six thousandths, you use the red. But green is pretty much... For almost everything I've done. All that's left is 
as these rod rod cap nut locks, I guess is what you would call these. Now these are the originals. Um, some people say replace them every time. Some people say don't bother putting them on. I'll show you what, from a little bit of research I've done, what would be the best approach at this point. So I've read up on these a little bit, not on this particular tractor. I couldn't find a lot of information, but there's a couple different ways they lock these. Some of the older engines have castle nuts where you put a pin through it, but if you can spin these on by hand easily, they're no good. But if they get tight as soon as they start, you can go with it. All right, that one's gotten pretty tight. I'll try this left-handed so the camera can see more. Makes it tougher for me, though. All right, that one spins on really easy, so it's no good. Now, there is a way we can make it better. I'll show you in a second, but... That one actually gets tight, so, so we'll go with it. Let me just snug it up against the cap. That one's too easy. All right, now might be a good time to show you how to fix them when they're like that. Okay, just to quickly show you what to do here. If you have a whole bunch of them that don't fit tight. Let's see if I can focus on this here. If you look, it's kind of a spring steel material. You now these little fingers on there. And we want to flatten them out a little bit so they grip the threads tighter. And the best way I've found doing this is you take a socket, in this case an 8 millimeter impact socket, and it fits in there and it'll hit those fingers. So you set it on a block of wood and just give it a little bit of a tap. If you tap too much, it'll be impossible to get the thread started. If you don't tap hard enough, you'll know because it'll spin right down. So let's try this out. Oh yeah, I didn't even touch it, so. It's actually my first time trying this, so. Still new to it. Let's see. Yeah, it feels good and tight going on there now. It's nice and snug. Double checking all my other ones here. Okay, so I'm going to do that to the rest of these real quick. Okay, so I went ahead and did the same thing to the rest. They're all in place. All right, next up we're going to Pull the block off of the stand so we can install the rear main seal and this plate and then do the oil pan at that point. Okay, so there's a couple things here. Um, I thought my kit came with a felt rear main seal, but it comes with a cork rear main seal. If I remember correctly, the early models came with the cork originally and then felt. And this one actually had felt when I took it off. 
the way this works, you install this into this housing. Once it slides over, there's a spiral groove here that works like a pump to keep working the oil back into the engine. Um, I'm going to put this on now because it's what I have. <clears throat> there's a good chance that before I put this tractor together, I might revamp this. What I'm wanting to try to do is find a rear main seal, a real seal off of an existing vehicle of some type that is this size, preferably if I can get a repair sleeve for it, where you slide a sleeve over so we don't have that groove anymore, and then machine this out to accept the seal. I have an extra one. I have two because I have the parts tractor. So I'm going to assemble this as it is now, but probably go for the real seal before actually assembling this. Put this up in here. You just feed it into this housing and work it around. It's technically there. It does fit that good and tight. So that's a good thing. So when I assemble this, I'm going to use the gray, ultra gray RTV like I did before. And I'll put plenty of assembly lube on here. All right, let's see if this is possible. Tell you what, that's a tight fitting seal. Be nice if this block stayed still. Let me see if I could find a way to make that stationary. I have the block sitting on a small stepladder at the moment. Engine hoist is holding up most of the weight, but at least now it won't move as easy. I'm trying to get it caught on the top and compress it a little. I'll tell you what, it does not want to go there. I don't want to roll it over. Yeah, it's starting to roll it out. That's not what I want to do. I'll put a couple long bolts in here just to keep this thing from moving around too much. Any of y'all know the trick for this that makes it easier? Definitely share it. Okay, it's either going to work or I'm going to cut myself.
Well, I'll just get slip off while I'm pushing with this so I don't cut myself. before I slide that out so don't pull it back off. Get this thing back on the stand here. First, show you around it a little. It's kind of what I was using to hold it up. Stop it from moving. Can't see much in there. It's a little dark, but get the idea. All right, next is the pickup tube for the oil and the oil pan. We're going to install the oil pickup tube here. That hole above it's a dipstick hole. I've already cleaned that out again, blew it out, and run a wire brush through the backside to make sure there's no debris or anything in there. So we are good to go as far as that goes. And the other side of that hole is actually where I have this little piece of rag shoved. That's where the oil pump mounts. This is our strainer that goes at the bottom of the tube. If you watch the disassembly video, you'd see this was completely plugged up. But you pop this clip off, and the strainer pops out. That's what it looks like. This part here fits tightly against, or actually it sits inside of a groove where your oil going into the oil pump gets pulled through this screen. So all your debris attaches to the outside. Um, if you have an old tractor that you don't know the condition of this, it's definitely worth checking. But mine was, it was completely plugged up. It was full of stuff. Okay, a couple things. I am going to use thread sealant on the bottom side because that's actually the top side and it could suck in air through the threads and cause an issue. Where the strainer sits, I'm not going to use sealant because that's submerged under oil anyway. You want to make sure you get none of this in the hole on the pipe. So I'm not even going to get the first thread, just in case. And it doesn't need much. Let me get some excess off there. All right. I think that sits straight like that. If I remember correctly how it came out. This is where the sump of the pan is. A 
I'll double check in the book before I put the pan on. Okay, only thing I'm lacking to put the oil pan on is lock washers. Thought I had a bunch, but I do not. Maybe I do, and I just can't find them. So as soon as I buy them or find them, I'll continue on with this. See y'all then. All right, I'm going to put some sealing on here. I'm going to also use the gray RTV for this. There's one thing I'll do differently on one bolt. All of these bolt holes, they're drilled, they have a bottom, right? They don't go into the crankcase at all. These two actually go outside the crankcase, but that's fine. This one that goes inside the crankcase, <clears throat> I'll put a little bit of thread sealant on the threads before I tighten it down. So oil won't seep past the threads and drip. It wouldn't be a bad leak. If you if this tractor was going to be used in a field, it probably wouldn't even matter. But I don't want any drips if possible, so that's what I'm going for. All right, looks like it should work. I did verify this is aiming properly. A couple screws before I set it completely down. At least one to go off of. All right, there we go. One thing I missed, I needed to go around that hole with RTV, not just the threads. I'm lift it a little bit and try that. See if I can do it without losing too much here. There we go. Put a little bit of thread sealing on there. I guess I could have used the RTV also. It doesn't matter a whole lot. Okay, well, a couple of places got a little bit too much RTV, but once that overhang dries, it'll tear right off and be fine. Um, later, I'm going to paint all these bolts, touch them up, um, maybe before the next video. Still got to get a decent drain plug. The one that was on it's pretty chewed up, but it'll plug the hole for now. Also, I want to get one with a magnet in it. So that's the plan anyway. So we got the crank rods, piston sleeves, all the timing components, oil pan, and lower end sealed. So we're ready to go. On the next video, we will do everything else probably. Um, cylinder head and all the valve train components, the governor assembly, and whatever else we need to bolt to it, thermostat housing and all of that. I don't have a thermostat or water pump yet, so hopefully I'll have one before then. Just a quick walk around what we got so far. We got the camshaft and all the timing components in, minus the governor assembly. We'll do that at the beginning of the next video. Actually, you may wait till after we get cylinder head on for that one. 
because it's got an arm that's in the way. Pistons, rods, and sleeves. Complete with the oil pan. Rear crank seal housing. The oil pump we will not install until after it's off the stand. <laughs> 